This episode of The Art of Charm is sponsored by London Real. London Real is a great podcast to get the London perspective on fitness, success, and philosophy from authors, visionaries, rock stars, and athletes broadcast live from their studio each week. I was a guest on this podcast, and they've been on Joe Rogan as well. If you dig The Art of Charm, you'll enjoy this show too. You guys can go to londonreal.tv to watch or subscribe in iTunes. This is The Art of Charm. Learn everything you need to know to crush it in business, love, and life. The Art of Charm is where ordinary guys become extraordinary men. Welcome to The Art of Charm, I'm Jordan Harbinger. If you're new to the show but you wanna know more about what we teach here at The Art of Charm, listen to The Art of Charm Toolbox at theartofcharmpodcast.com slash toolbox. Looking forward to meeting all you guys here at AOC. Today we're with Tom Corley, author of Rich Habits. We're gonna talk about the differences in thoughts and especially daily habits between wealthy and poor people and we're gonna talk about why wealthy people are healthy people, usually, and how your mindsets influence your results, and that should sound familiar to you. We're also gonna talk about how consistent self-education can change your mindsets and keep you moving forward, as well as the secret, quote-unquote, backdoor to networking with highly successful people, even when you're average or even poor, and how rich habits add up to an avalanche of success over time. Rich people know this consistently and look for opportunities to exercise these muscles. Then we're gonna wrap with a fashion tip from Aaron Marino. So enjoy this one with Tom Corley, author of Rich Habits. Tell us a little bit about what rich thinking even means. So first of all, why should we listen to you? Who are you? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I am just an ordinary CPA, but what I guess separates me from all the other CPAs out there is um, I had a small business client who came to me one night back in 2004. I had just taken over my firm. He uh, was essentially going out of business. His bank had just shut down his line of credit couldn't make payroll that Friday. And this was a a big guy, Jordan. He was like six foot five, about pushing 300. He had a a very successful auto body business. He came to me to see if he could get some of my banking relationships to help him bail him out. And he's like a Hail Mary pass in the last seconds of the game. And I I said, I, I couldn't help him because those banking relationships you have to develop over a long time and, uh, they weren't going to do it. So, we had a conversation and he just started to break down and cried right in front of me. He just said, look, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. What are your wealthy, successful clients doing that I'm not doing? And the problem that I have with that, Jordan, is I usually get these clients when they're already successful. I mean, they can afford a CPA. When they come to me, they already have something going on. So I don't see them in the evolution in accumulating their wealth. And, and what they do to become successful. So I started with a small research project. It, it was just going on the internet, trying to buy books, understand how wealthy people become wealthy. Uh, I really couldn't find anything that told me what they do every single day. I wanted to know how do they tie their shoes? How do they walk? I wanted to know all of the details of their day. That small research project turned into a five-year study. Uh, I became obsessed with it. I interviewed 233 wealthy individuals and then 128 poor individuals. And then I spent about 16 months analyzing the data. I had this epiphany one day. I said, my gosh, it's their daily behaviors, their daily habits, the, the things that they're doing on a regular basis. The rich people do certain things and the poor people do certain things. <clears throat> and it's like a huge divide, like the Grand Canyon. I had a, was running a couple of seminars and training programs off of the research, mainly with clients, but also I did some at the YMCA, local YMCA. I did a couple of these learning sessions. One of the individuals in the learning session I was doing on just goal setting, I explained to him how a goal is, is only a goal if it has two things, uh, physical activity. It's got to have physical activity and 100% achievability. This was a very successful insurance businessman who uh, was trying to add life insurance business to his insurance business, his property and casualty. Well, after the training session, he realized, my gosh, the, the, the goal that I had of increasing my life insurance commissions by $100,000, which he, he failed to meet three years in a row, I think he got up to 40000 was the closest. Oh, wow. 
he decided to come to my training in the seminar. I explained to him how his wish of a hundred thousand was was not a goal. It's just a wish. We sat down later that week, and I actually broke down uh, his wish of a hundred thousand into the physical activity, the goal, which was to make ten additional telemarketing phone calls a day. And so he started doing that. He had some real success. He called me up and said, you know, I hit 50,000. It was like three months later. He said, I'm going to increase it to 30 telemarketing phone calls a day, which he did. And he ended up finishing the year over $150,000 in life insurance commissions. So that was one thing that made me realize, gosh, I think I'm onto something. Okay, but let me let me stop you for a second. And just to play devil's advocate, and again, you're a guest on my show, so I, I'm supposed to be nice to you, but I'm also going to challenge you a little bit here. So, yeah, he made more sales calls. He made more sales. I mean, what's the magic? Well, to him, it was magic because he was sending out flyers, advertising, making cold calls, you know, physical cold calls, meeting some networking. It's more detailed than that. We actually got into the data of how he actually had success getting the 40000 in life insurance commissions. And it was predominantly from making some cold calls himself. So I said, well, listen, if, if that worked, let's just duplicate it and make, you know, in the life insurance business, it works. You make these telemarketing phone calls. So he hired an outside firm to develop the script. And a lot of these strategies, they're not magic, but to some people, they're, they are uh, something that they don't do. And just to take it to the, uh, another example, which was I was trying to develop my financial planning business. And I said, heck, let me try and use some of this, these rich habits strategies, rich habits to apply to the financial planning business. So three things that I uncovered in my research on how people develop strong, valuable relationships. And it's through three things primarily. It's the happy birthday calls, the life event calls, and the hello calls. Uh, the hello calls are really like a reconnaissance mission. You, you're calling people that you're trying to network with. And sure trying to gather information. So the idea is to gather as much information on that person and their family, their education, their background, you know, where they went to school. There's, I have on my website at richhabits.net, I have all of the uh, like 35 things you should be gathering. I met this guy at a networking event. Another thing I, I found in the, my research that wealthy people do a lot of networking, I started doing networking, which I never really did. I hated it. But I met this guy who was number two guy at a big pharmaceutical company here in New Jersey. We have pharmaceutical business is big here. I started making these hello calls and I was gathering information just like the rich people said I should. And so I found out about his family, his kids' names, what his kids do and all this different stuff. I kept doing these hello calls for about six months and he inserted his secretary in between me and him because I think he was just realizing that, hey, this guy's just trying to you know, sell me something. I was saying to him every time I finished up a call, hey, you know, I also do financial planning. Besides oh, sure. So I get that. So now I had this obstacle, his secretary. And so she kind of stopped me a couple of times from getting through to him. And then one day on a Sunday, I was reading the newspaper and I saw an article about this free throw shooting contest that these New Jersey kids were entered in. And I, I saw his uh, kid's name in, in the article. In fact, his kid they had made it to the finals of the districts. So I cut out the article and then I called, I tried to reach him that Monday. And of course, his secretary blocked me. So I just said, hey, look, I just want to fax him this article from a South Jersey newspaper. Uh, she said, fine, go ahead. And I sent it to him. Well, Jordan, in about five minutes, I got a call back from this guy because he hadn't seen the article and he read it. It was blown away by it. He was so happy that I sent it. He had me on the phone for about a half an hour uh, talking about the whole free throw shooting contest. And then at the end of the phone call, he said, hey, I seem to remember, he said it kind of jokingly, that you do financial planning. I said, yeah, I do. And he said, well, why don't you meet me in my office? I have a, a need. So I met, went to his office, you know, about a week later. He pushed across the desk a piece of paper, which represented something he printed out from his old 401k that he had. It was $1.4 million. He was just sitting in an old 401k. And I rolled it over and I made $60,000. That with the insurance guy made me realize I've got to tell people about this. So I'd never written a book before. I wrote. I wrote a lot of technical stuff, but never a book. So that took me – that was a challenge, but I ended up – took me about a year, and I finally got the book done. 
And, um, you know, the rest is history. That's kind of how it evolved. Excellent. Let's back up the truck a little bit, because when you were younger, you were wealthy and then you weren't. We, when I was nine years old, I remember like it was yesterday. I remember the day. I remember the, the day in school. It was like the whole thing was burned into my memory. I remember coming home that night and everybody was distraught the night before the dad's warehouse had burned to the ground. And Jordan, they didn't have insurance like they have nowadays. In those days, they had the insurance my dad had was through the warehouse. And that was typical. And the insurance was supposed to cover everything. But, you know, warehouse didn't have adequate insurance, you know, and my dad spent 18 months going to court trying to get some money out of, you know, different creditors that people that owed him. We literally went from being worth about four or five million dollars back then to being worth nothing overnight because my dad, being the type of guy he was, took all the money he had and paid off all his vendors, which was about four and a half million dollars. Well, he had nothing left. You know, I had to work my way through college. I was a janitor, worked 20 hours a week, uh, went to school during the day and janitor at night. I did that for four years. When you grow up poor, you don't know what it's like to be rich. When you're rich and then you become poor, all you can think about is what it's like to be rich. It really is like a thorn in your side growing up. It's a whole different experience. I think that it really affected me. And, you know, one of the first things my publicist tried to do was try and understand why I actually did this research. Yeah, I told her the story about the small business guy. And she said, I don't think that's the reason. She, I think you did it because you really were trying, in the back of your brain and your subconscious, you were trying to understand why are wealthy people wealthy and poor people poor? And I, I think there's some truth to that. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And you studied, so you studied 233 wealthy people, 128 poor people, and you found a big difference in habits, not just, okay, call people when their kid shows up in the newspaper, but you know, we talked before the show and you mentioned that 40% of our daily activities are habits, which means that 40% of the time we're literally just on autopilot moving unconsciously towards either wealth or poverty. Yeah, that's right. And, and that comes from a 2006 Duke study. They had 99 people over an 84 day period and then they extended it to like a year. What they found, Jordan, was that on average, 40% of everyone's activities during the day were habits. They were unconscious behaviors. Uh, and that's a great thing if uh, the majority of your habits are good daily success habits. You're unconsciously moving towards wealth. It's a bad thing if you have failure habits or habits that are harming you. Uh, you're unconsciously moving towards poverty. And I, I think there's one of the reasons why they call the secret to success is a lot of people don't even understand that their habits are the cause of their wealth or their poverty. Yeah, of course they don't. I mean, nobody thinks about that being a system of habits or the result of any habits. What's the difference then between these habits? I mean, obviously, there's a tremendous difference in what rich people do versus what poor people do. And yes, networking and faxing articles about people's kids is great sales practice, but what about some of the daily habits and choices and behaviors that dictate our financial circumstances in our lives. Well, what I uncovered was like, if you look at some of the, the poverty habits, the poor people spend an inordinate amount of time watching TV, whereas the, the wealthy people, the 79% of them spent uh, less than an hour a day watching TV. Now, when I did this research, Facebook wasn't even on the radar and uh, neither was Twitter. Now th it's kind of shifting. Our behaviors are shifting from TV to the internet, but it's the same concept. If you're spending recreational time on the internet or watching TV, uh, that's time that wealthy people are spending by uh, reading, self-improvement, self-education, engaged in networking. They're on board of directors uh, for different nonprofits. Uh, they volunteer. They're going to school at night. They're, some of them were teaching at night. Some of them did speaking engagements. Some of them engaged in writing. There was all these activities. Yeah, they're hustling. They're hustling. And they they made a habit out of hustling, uh, whereas the poor people made a habit out of you know sitting and watching TV or spending time on the internet. Yeah, chilling. <laughs> yeah. And that's you know one of them. The other thing is, and some of these things aren't even related to wealth building, but they're related to health. You know, wealthy people are healthy people. That's something I like to say. 
one of the reasons wealthy people I found in my research, they engaged in a seems like exercise du jour for wealthy people was aerobic exercise. And when I, I dug deep, the reasons they gave was it, it helped them maintain their weight, keep their weight off. It uh, helped them with the blood flow, the heart beating, the oxygen to the brain. All these things they, they explained to me were they thought good things and helped them in business because it gave them more energy. It made them healthier, which reduced the number of sick days. The increased energy you know, caused an increase in productivity. So if you combine the fewer sick days and increased energy, more productivity, uh, you have uh, more of an opportunity to become wealthy. Let's take a quick time out for a sec. Some people think the Art of Charm live training programs are just about picking up girls. And honestly, there's some of that. One week with us and you'll be rocking out in that department, I promise. But as a guy, I know how important it is to be awesome and well-rounded. And not just awesome with girls. You gotta be awesome at work, awesome at home, and awesome with your friends and family. Guys, we need to step it up everywhere. And that's why we call our company The Art of Charm, that special something that gets you results wherever you go. And trust me, the results are real. Every day I get new emails and calls from the guys who've decided to take our live training programs, and what I hear is simply amazing. Just weeks after graduating, they land a promotion, they form a new wolf pack, and they start a new business, or find a partner. They have a new life, and it's not an accident. Call or email us, and we'll see what the Art of Charm live training programs can do for you. Now, back to the good stuff. Excellent. But is it really as simple as working harder slash working more is the secret to wealth? No, it's, it's about how you spend your time. Good, okay. I wrote a great article on my website, the 1,440 minutes of how wealthy people spend their day. Everybody has 1,440 minutes. And on average, the wealthy people seem to work between 45 and 55 hours a week. But it's the in-between time. It's when they get up at four in the morning or 4.30 in the morning, and a lot of them got up three hours or more before they uh, even arrived at work. Also, at the end of the day, instead of coming home and eating dinner and watching TV, two out of the five days, they were out networking, volunteering, building relationships, doing some extracurricular things that, you know, related to some goal or some dream that they were pursuing. You know, a lot of these things that they did in their extracurricular time were productive and in pursuit of something, some goal or some dream or some major purpose. Excellent. So they're always looking at the next level, always striving for the next level, not just grinding it away. Yeah. And that's part of the rich thinking. It's the way that they think. They look at accumulating wealth and becoming successful with the way that they think about how they're going to approach their day. They set up, create to-do lists. They have this five strategies that I uncovered on, on how they manage their time and, and how they are productive. I talk about that in the Rich Kids book that's coming out in July. They uh, just uh, have certain strategies that they employ on these extracurricular time frames that um, really are earth shattering to me. They, they were and to a lot of people that it seems that I, that I meet on Twitter and Facebook and, and LinkedIn. Excellent. When we talk about the purpose of habits, literally these are systems that you put in place that become, of course, habits so that you don't have to think about doing them. You don't have to force yourself to do them. The hurdles, both logistically and emotionally, mentally, whatever, are, are not there because they're habits. So we yeah. want to create those and we want to create the wealthy version thereof instead of the poor version thereof. That's right. What you want to do is you want to get your, I call it the success seesaw. You want to get your seesaw tipping in the right direction. You want to have more than 50% of your daily habits to be rich habits, it tipping in the right direction. If you have more rich habits than you have poverty habits, then you're unconsciously or subconsciously or whatever you want to call it, moving towards wealth. If you have more poverty habits than rich habits, then you're unconsciously moving towards poverty. You don't know why you're failing in life. Uh, and it all comes down to your habits. Excellent. And so how do we start to replace our limiting beliefs slash our crappy habits with wealthy habits? Because everybody's probably got poverty habits somewhere, um, or at least we've all fought against those before. Like watching TV, did a ton of that as a kid, don't do a lot of it now. Not exercising, went through a phase where I didn't care, right? A lot of people are doing that, they struggle as they get older. Other people do things like waste money on short-term wins or 
don't take care of their credit, things like that, because they want to have stuff and then they end up paying, you know, a hundred grand more for their house or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Well, in my book, the first rich habit is really, I call it the self-assessment habit. And wealthy people have this habit of continuously moving towards self-improvement, trying to make themselves better. They engage in self-assessment on a regular basis. And what I uh, explain in, in rich habits in my book is the exercise that you go through is essentially you have to be brutally honest with yourself, list all of your the habits that you think are holding you back in life on a piece of paper, one column, that's all your bad habits, all the things that are responsible for, you think are responsible for uh, the being stuck. Uh, and then I show how you can take those poverty habits and invert them and turn them into rich habits. For example, let's say you don't exercise, you don't exercise at all. Uh, well, that's a poverty habit. Your new rich habit would be I exercise 30 minutes today. If you smoke cigarettes, that's a poverty habit. Your new rich habit is I didn't smoke a cigarette today. If you watch too much TV, your new rich habit is I watched less than an hour of TV today. So you go through all of your poverty habits, you invert them into rich habits, and then that becomes your rich habits checklist. And uh, you carry that around with you and you check it off. And if I have a good day. I have accomplished 30 or 40 percent of my rich habits checklist. That to me is a good day. Uh, some days I only get 20 percent done. But the point is it becomes a process of success, of, uh, the process of changing your habits, of following good habits. It's a success process. You know, the interesting thing is poor people say, you, you know, I don't know what I'm doing wrong in life. And my uh, rebuttal to that is, no, you're succeeding 100 percent. Because you are following all of these poverty habits every single day successfully, and they're leading you down the path of poverty. So all you have to do is change the process. It's the same thing. It's the same idea. Just change your process from failure to success. And the way you do that is by changing your habits through the self-assessment process. That's very useful because it's really easy for people to go, oh, I know all this stuff. And I get letters like this all the time where guys go, you know, I know you teach body language, but... I'm really good at that stuff. You know, I'm a dance instructor. I'm a martial artist. I get that stuff. And then they'll listen to a show with a lot of nuanced body language and they'll go, oh my God, I'm not nearly as aware as I thought I was. Because it's a consistent thing that you have to be doing. You have to consistently evaluate what you're eating. You have to consistently evaluate what you're doing to earn money and to make a living. You have to consistently evaluate anything that you want to get better at because what you focus on grows, right? Yeah, you just used a magic word that I, I use probably too much, but consistency. I think my son, who's just turned 20, he's like been my rich habits guinea pig. I've been you know feeding him this stuff since uh, I started doing the research. One of the things I keep telling him is because he's in a sales role now with a big company. I said you have to consistently every single day, you know, follow some of these habits in trying to you know go after your prospects. You have to drip on them every day. You have to do certain things. I go through all of the, the relationship building strategies that, that I unearth with him. He is really knocking it out of the park every week. And he's the only, one of the only ones in his group that are doing this. Every week he's closing a deal. And he said, Dad, you know, it's, you're right. It's just about being consistent. Every week doing certain disciplines and these habits, they do work. You know, one week it's a $5,000 deal. The next week is $18,000. Next week it's $45,000. It all depends. But the important thing is he's doing it. Every single day, he's following these rich habits every single day, and he's, he's uh, already one-third. He's only been in the sales role, I think, six weeks. He's already one-third of the way towards his sales goal for the year, and he thinks he'll be able to hit it you know, within another three or four months. Oh, my gosh. Good for him. Yeah, and good for you. You must be really proud. I am. I am. Yeah. So what kind of practical things can we do, aside from the self-assessment, that will help us create these positive rich habits? Well, I think like one of the things that I talk about a lot, too, is changing your beliefs. I've come to the conclusion that our beliefs, which are really many computer programs, are maybe the secret ingredient behind the habits that we adopt. Yes. One of the core principles at The Art of Charm is that your beliefs dictate your actions, which dictate your results. What beliefs really represent are emotionalized thought program that somehow got into your brain, into your subconscious. And and just so your listeners know that the subconscious is not this mysterious thing. It's your limbic system and it's your brain stem. There are three parts of the brain. The brain stem is the oldest part. The limbic system is the next oldest part. And then the neocortex is the new part, the part that is for higher decision 
making higher learning and all that. So our subconscious, these the limbic system controls a big portion of our emotions. So our limbic system creating these emotions that then it attached to these thoughts that we think, and it, you know, it might be something that happens. You know, for me, I always thought I was stupid uh, growing up because I remember back as a child, I made a, a mistake and forgot something, and my father uh, said to me, he didn't even realize, you know, he was harming me emotionally. I I didn't even at the time, but he said to me, you know, if your head wasn't attached to your shoulders, you'd leave it wherever you were, and that created a emotionalized thought that created a belief system in me that I was stupid. And up until the beginning of the eighth grade, I was pretty much barely a C student. I ran into a teacher in the eighth grade, Miss Summers, who was a science teacher. I was failing her class, of course, like I did most of the classes. And she said, you know, I actually think you're smart. I just don't think you work hard enough. I don't think you do your homework. You really don't hand in your homework. And I said, I don't do homework because I'm, I'm not smart enough. She said, well, I think you can get the highest grade in the class or close to it if you really apply yourself because I think you're smart. I think you're a lot smarter than you think you are. I went home that day, Jordan. All I could think about was I'm going to go home and I'm going to study like crazy. And I did. I spent the next three days studying for the uh, science test and I got a 99. I got the second highest grade in the class. And my entire belief system just came crashing down. I went on to become, you know, a B plus student, uh, a minus student, carried me all the way through grad school. But my whole belief system, because of one person who changed my beliefs because she triggered an emotion in me, these beliefs are like the glue to them are your emotions. So if you can get an emotional thought into your subconscious that changes an existing belief, you will eliminate that existing belief. And that is actually a springboard to helping you become successful in life. That's amazing. We don't talk about this a lot on the show specifically, but that is actually one of the primary teaching methods that we use at The Art of Charm in order to change belief systems, is using emotional triggers and cues to make sure that these belief systems that aren't serving you are, you know, essentially we poke holes in things and then we help build new ones that do serve you much better. And it's funny you should mention the school and the student example because there's actual scientific studies now, and I'm sure you've seen this, or if you haven't, you should check it out, where they have teachers that, of course, people get grades and that influences your belief system because of that feedback. Well, what the teachers did was they simply went, all right, I'm going to give half the class really good grades and I'm going to give half the class really mediocre or bad grades. Well, what happened was after a few months of doing this, the students that got mediocre grades, no matter what, they got mediocre grades when everything was all fair and equal. And then when they tested the kids that got great grades, even when they did poorly, they actually performed better when they were tested for real. So basically what the teacher had assumed or made the kids think that they were became reality for the students in terms of their performance in the class. It's amazing how strong our beliefs are and where do our beliefs come from? They come, primarily they come from our parents, our upbringing in our home. And then a lot of these beliefs stay with us from childhood all the way through adulthood. And then we're scratching our heads and saying, geez, I just don't know why I'm screwing up in life. A lot of it has to do with the beliefs that you picked up from your parents at home. It also has to do with your environment. You know, we pick up beliefs from our you know, close friends or people that we admire. And this is where mentoring is so important. And my Rich Kids book is really, I wrote it specifically to help people mentor other people. I think mentoring in my stats, although only 24% of the wealthy said that they had a, a mentor in their life, the rest who didn't have a mentor who were successful, they j became successful because of uh, you know reading books or through the school of hard knocks. So the 24% that did have a mentor, the interesting stat in this is that 93% of them said that they attributed their success to their mentors. All right, guys, now I want to take another time out for a sec. A lot of people think the Art of Charm live training programs are just about picking up girls. And honestly, yeah, there's some of that. A week with us, you're going to be rocking out in that department. I definitely promise you that. But as a guy, it is very important to be awesome as well as well-rounded. And I don't just mean awesome with girls. I mean great at work, great at home, great with your friends and family. You need to step it up everywhere. 
That's why we call our company the Art of Charm. It's that special something that gets you results wherever you go. And you guys can trust me, the results are real. Every day I get emails and calls from the guys who decided to take our live training programs. In fact, I'm gonna share some of those with you guys really, really soon. We're getting those lined up so you don't have to listen to me talk about boot camps anymore, but you can listen to actual AOC alumni. And what I hear is simply amazing. Weeks after graduating, they land a promotion, they've got a new wolf pack, they start a new business, or they even find a partner. It's essentially a new life, and it's not an accident. If you guys are listening to The Art of Charm, you're the type of person who's already interested in improving themselves. There's a lot of options out there today. I think you guys have already decided. If you want to discuss your options for improving your relationships, career prospects, and your entire life for that matter, send me an email, jordanh at theartofcharm.com, or call the number at the top of the website, and we can schedule a call to help sort you out. Hope to hear from you guys soon. Enjoy the rest of the show. This having a mentor who can instill beliefs, even in an organization, can change that entire organization overnight. That's how powerful beliefs are. How do we start to figure out how to change these beliefs and how do we sort of maybe reinvent ourselves so we can look at these habits that are poor and create a checklist that we can do on the daily to make sure we're doing the rich guy habits? The first thing in changing any habit, the first step is you have to become aware right. of your behavior. If you're not aware of your behavior, you're never going to be able to change a habit. So a lot of the thoughts that we have are self-talk. Sometimes we actually talk to ourselves and sometimes we just have thoughts in our head that are self-talk, verbal and nonverbal self-talk. I think you have to monitor your self-talk for 30 days. And I talk about this in um, the Rich Kids book. Just monitor what you say to yourself for 30 days. Don't do anything. Don't change anything. Just listen to what that voice inside your head is telling you. You're going to start to uh, realize that there are beliefs behind some of the talk. What you want to do is evaluate that verbal and nonverbal self-talk and then write it down. Highlight all of the self-talk that's negative self-talk. So now you have, imagine you have this uh, list of all the things that you said to yourself in a 30-day period. Highlight the things that were negative and then now that you've highlighted the negative self-talk, catch yourself actually engaged in it and then say, cancel, stop. So interrupt that pattern. Interrupt that poverty thinking and then replace it with some upbeat, positive self-talk. Anything that's the opposite of negative. Right. Keeping you motivated, keeping you looking forward. You know, if you say, I'm such an idiot, you say, I'm a pretty smart person, just made a mistake. I'm a really smart person. If you catch yourself engaged in the bad behavior, replace it with some positive self-talk, and you keep doing this, there's a study that was done that we talked about where a habit takes between 18 and 254 days to form. If you engage in this habitual thinking of stopping the negative thinking and then replacing it with positive self-talk, it will take 18 to 254 days approximately for that self-talk programming to start to take hold, that positive self-talk, and, and then you'll find yourself after a certain number of days, I don't know how many days, it depends on the person, you will have reprogrammed your thinking from poverty thinking to rich thinking. You'll be starting to talk to yourself in a positive, upbeat way, and that's important because it'll alter your beliefs and then it'll alter your behavior, your habits. Okay, excellent. So we break those negative patterns and we replace them with positive ones. I think also the reading that you talked about before, the self-education, I think that helps as well because if you're constantly bringing in new ideas, positive thinking from other people, knowledge and wisdom from other people, it is a little bit harder to be negative and much easier to be positive because you have more options on the table and you're learning to think about problems in more constructive ways as well. You're hitting on a good point. One of the interesting things that I found in my research was that the wealthy people seem to be for the most part, very open-minded, open to new information. They were always trying to educate and learn and evolve their thinking. They didn't hold on specifically to any ideology. They were more interested in actually learning new things that might even break down any ideology they had. So they were engaged in this self-education on a daily basis. It was on average 30 uh, minutes a day they were uh, reading and just trying to find the stat on that. I think it was 88% read 30 minutes or more each day of something that was educational. Whereas on, on the poor people, only 2% engaged in that rich habit. So when you engage in 
the rich habit of daily, 30 minutes a day, self-education. You're picking up new things. You're starting to see new opportunities. And these opportunities translate into more money. Uh, one of the things we talked about before the show here was getting around people that are wealthy and successful and that have those habits already. Because, of course, those things are contagious, as is the thinking. What if I'm poor? What if I'm average? How do I get in contact and be around wealthy people? How does one start that relationship? If I don't go to a fancy private school or work in a large corporation, how do I start to absorb those habits and get around those people? Yeah, well, one of the best strategies that I found from my research is a lot of these wealthy people developed these strong, valuable relationships by networking, but also by volunteering. They volunteered for charitable nonprofit groups. Most of those charitable nonprofit groups, the, the people that run them, I know because when I found this rich habit, I immediately joined three charitable nonprofit groups. Most of the people on those boards are very successful people, and some of them are millionaires, multimillionaires. Uh, what they have that you don't have is a Rolodex or a contact database. They have all of these relationships that they've built up over their lifetime with other successful people. So when you join a, a nonprofit organization, what you actually are able to do is showcase your skills in a way that is non-threatening where you can't lose your job. You know what I mean? You're volunteering. Right. You have to showcase your skills to all of these people on the board. And a lot of these people on the board, I know because I do it, are part of committees. They run committees. I have this poor person who's on my committee. They're doing a knockout job. And so now I get to develop a relationship with them. And uh, this relationship grows like a tree. And then you open up your Rolodex or your contact database. And, and let me give you an example. This is a real, real life story. This is one of the people in my study. He was in the equivalent of the mailroom in this big corporation. He wanted to get out of there and get into management. So he started doing these extracurricular things. One of the things he did was he joined the main trade group in the region. And he started volunteering for different projects and different committees. And he did this for like two or three years, still in the mailroom. And then one day he tells this story. It's a, it just blows me away. They, they have a big meeting, the region. The, all of the CEOs of the, in this industry are getting together, all the senior executives his CEO of his company is sitting at a table with another CEO. The other CEO sees his name tag and says, hey, you, you know, you got a great guy manager uh, working for you. Uh, his name is Joe Schmo. Boy, he's really fantastic. He's on these two committees. I've been working with him for like a year. He's so smart. And, you know, congratulations. You're lucky to have him. The CEO just shook his head. Yeah, thank you. You know, that CEO got back to the office. One of the first things he did is he asked his secretary, who is this Joe Schmo? And she looked him up and she said, well, he works in the mailroom. And he said, not anymore. He got promoted into the uh, management trainee program. And the guy ended up rising up to a senior uh, executive level at the corporation and became a multimillionaire. Amazing. So he literally, he could have languished in the mailroom or just waited for his boss to maybe promote him and work through all the politics of the corporation. But instead, he took this almost like secret back door to networking with highly successful people, made an impression on the right people just due to sheer probability of that happening over time, and boom, immediate shortcut. And what you're getting into is something I call opportunity luck. When you start doing these positive, rich habits, you start following them every day, things like this, two CEOs meeting in a trade group get together, opportunity luck presents itself. It's like, the way I like to describe it is these rich habits are like snowflakes on a mountainside. They accumulate and they accumulate and they accumulate. And then eventually you have what I call an avalanche of success event. And that's when opportunity luck happens. It might be a promotion, a bonus, a big new customer, a new client. It could be any number of things. But if you're dripping every day, if like snowflakes on the mountainside, it's going to happen. It, this opportunity luck does manifest itself. It's just a numbers game. Yeah, that's true. And I think we do a lot of that here at AOC as well, where we talk about giving value to people, helping people keeping people networked and allowing people to have access to your network. Because if you do it enough, even if you only get a 1% return in terms of your time, it doesn't really matter because sometimes that return is somebody saying, oh, I want to hire you for a position that's going to change your whole life. Yeah, and, and it happens all the time to wealthy people. They're wealthy because of this opportunity luck, because of this avalanche of success event. So they're doing these habits every day. 
They create this avalanche of success event. They become wealthy. And there's no secret to success. It's just doing certain habits every single day. Excellent. Thanks so much. Is there anything you want to leave us with? Yeah, I, just a couple of tips. Engaging in 20 to 30 minutes a day of daily self-education. Do it the first thing you, in the morning or whenever you wake up. That's the best time because your willpower is strongest when you wake up in the morning or your conscious mind is not working. It's still coming out of the beta phase. And you can engage in these educational reading and it'll take about 30 minutes before your subconscious wakes up and says, hey, I hate doing this stuff. The first thing in the morning, just get up. As soon as you get up, engage in 30 minutes of self-education, something related to your career, your passion, your, your dream, your goal, whatever it might be. Do it first thing as soon as you wake up in the morning. I'm telling you, it's a life-changing thing. You'll see over time, uh, it will create a lot of opportunities for you. Excellent. So a lot of people are thinking, oh, I'll just read when I have time. But if you make time in the morning, almost like meditation, just get it done, knock it out, bank it for the day, and there's your first rich habit. Yeah, make it a habit. Make it a habit. It'll take you about between 18 and 254 days before you're doing it every day. But so what? In 254 days from now, you're still going to be 254 days older. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thomas Corley, richhabits.net. We're going to link that up in the show notes as well. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jordan, for having me on. I appreciate it. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. I really thought it was interesting, the thoughts and especially these daily habits between wealthy and poor people. Always something I had a hunch on. I always spotted bad habits in others and good habits in others, but it's really interesting to separate those by socioeconomic strata as opposed to just something good to take from some and something to avoid in others. It really is interesting how that correlates there. It's also really interesting that wealthy people are healthy people and that mindsets definitely influence the results even in this economic area and that consistent self-education is one of the primary drivers of that. I also really enjoyed that there's sort of a secret to networking with highly successful people. It makes perfect sense, and it's totally easy and rewarding. That whole charity thing is just so money, and a lot of people really underestimate that and don't engage in that nearly enough. So cultivate some of these rich habits, check out the book, and enjoy that avalanche of success over time. And check out more from Tom Corley at richhabits.net. There's even a quiz there for parents to make sure that they're imprinting the right habits on their kids, which I thought was especially interesting. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Until next time. Due to popular demand, we got fashion tips from my man Aaron Marino from imalphaM.com. He's going to be dropping some knowledge on us to learn how to dress our best. I was watching a show the other day, and I see these guys, and they're being interviewed. I can't remember the topic, but they looked really goofy and novice and amateurish, even though they were in suits. Everything looked to be together, but the tie was super wide, and something about that kind of made their heads look small, which made me think that they were knuckleheads. <laughs> I know that's a ridiculous statement, but it took me a really long time to figure out why these guys looked dumb. And it wasn't just the way they were being made to look in the documentary. It, the ties were actually coloring my opinion. Am I being ridiculous here, or is there a tie width that we need to be looking at? No, it, it boils down to aesthetics. And aesthetically, you want to make sure that you're matching your tie width to your lapel width. And so, you know, the trend, you know, super skinny ties. Okay, if you were wearing that with a standard, you know, three-inch lapel, it's going to look ridiculous, and vice versa. If you're wearing that three-inch tie and you're wearing small lapels, it's absolutely going to not balance. You need it to balance. You need it to coordinate in order for it to really come together and to look consistent. Great. That's a really good tip. And so avoid looking like a pinhead and get a tie that's appropriate to match your lapel. For more from Aaron Marino, search for Alpha M on YouTube or go to imalphaM.com. Solid show as usual, if I do say so myself. Show feedback and guest suggestions. We rely on you guys to help keep our finger on the pulse. So if you know someone who's a good fit for the show, let us know at jordanh at theartofcharm.com. Bootcamp details, that's our live training at theartofcharm.com. And that's also where you can find links to us on Twitter, Facebook, and other social media. If you're listening to this but you're not subscribed in iTunes or Stitcher, then that needs to change. Getting our shows delivered free to your phone or computer is the best way to make sure you don't miss anything. You can do that by going to iTunes and searching for the Art of Charm podcast or by going to theartofcharm.com slash iTunes and clicking subscribe. That's it. 
You guys can also help us. If you subscribe in iTunes or Stitcher, give us a five-star rating and write something nice. We'll love you forever. Just go to iTunes.com slash The Art of Charm and it'll take you right there. When you write us a review, it not only makes us feel proud, but it helps keep us in the ranks so that other people who can use this information can find the show more easily and get the credible advice that they need. It's also the best way to support the show other than purchasing training from us. So tell your friends, because the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to someone else, either in person or shared on the web. So have a great week, go out there and get social, and leave everything better than you found it. Thanks for listening to The Art of Charm. Get more confidence, relationship skills, life hacks, and everything for the extraordinary man at theartofcharmpodcast.com.